Hi, I'm Bruce Bantz from Total Education Centre and thank you for watching today's video. We really hope you enjoy these videos and that they teach you something new. If they don't, if they do, please give us a like down below on the button and let them uh, let us know. If you have any questions, don't forget you can contact us through the channel or through the website. And don't forget to visit our website, totaleducationcenter.com.au. There you'll find all the lecture notes for this, these videos. You'll find student notes, teacher notes, you'll find old exam papers and things that will help you do your best in your studies. We hope you enjoy today's video. Please enjoy it. Hi, I'm Bruce Pattinson. Today's lecture we're going to be talking about the setting in 1984 in Metropolis. And we're going to talk very, very briefly about how that setting affects different ways that the two texts can be compared and look at the analysis based on the context of those things. Obviously the setting of both texts comes out of the context and before you watch this lecture you should go back and watch the one on context because that, that lecture will certainly give you a broader detail of, about what I'm, of what I'm going to talk about. Orwell's setting in 1984 um, is obviously set in England and once was called it England but is now called Airstrip 1. And the setting reflects the austerity that, that came after and during the war. Um, it had been part of English life since socialism, Ingsoc takes over in the text and when the party takes control of society and they never really got out of that period of austerity because partly the, the control in that society is that sense of austerity and the poverty. Winston lives in a, a place wonderfully called Victory Mansions which doesn't certainly live up to any sense of victory at all. Um, nothing really works, it's very dilapidated, the elevators don't function and everything looks grimy and it's dirty. And um, we can see, he can't even remember what London was like, and we see the great quote here. Were there always these vistas of rotting 19th century houses, their sides shored up with balks of timber, their windows patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions? And the bomb sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air and the willow herb straggled over the heaps of rubble and the places where the bombs had cleared a larger patch and where they had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. So this sort of bleak, um, dirty, run-down environment is the environment of 1984. It's, it's wonderfully bleak and those descriptions that he gives of those settings are amazing and very, very peaceful. Even, even they go to the country um, and they sort of can't remember what, what the world was like prior to the war and then socialism taking over. We, we go out to the country, but we really return to the environment. It's mainly a city environment. It's an urban environment. And even in the room that they're at, we see, we see the rat and there's, there's dirt and those sorts of gnarly things. Um, the, the bed even has bed bugs and, and they go there for, for love and uh, nothing really is, is wonderful in this society at all. Um, there's a certain feeling of inevitable doom about the way that the society is fading and certainly inevitable doom about the relationship that Julia and Winston have and that's locked into that sense of setting. Um, we see bomb falling and he describes where the bombs and the plaster and all those sorts of things falling down and you need to, to look at those descriptions very carefully. Um, probably the, one of the, the interesting things is room 101 in the text and, and everybody sort of talks about that. But there are other, other areas that you can focus on as well. And you'll mention room 101, of course, when you look at the, the torture and all those sorts of things. But think about how he describes the ministry of love and the irony and, and the idea of that in this text. He says, the ministry of love was the really frightening one. There were no windows in it at all. Winston had never been inside the ministry of love, nor within half a kilometre of it. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating through a maze of barbed wire entanglements, steel doors, and hidden machine gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were roamed by gorilla-faced guards in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. He builds a picture of a world tainted by this controlling force. And that irony there in, that, in the sense of the ministry of love is surrounded by barbed wire and machine guns. And, and it's a wonderful sort of description. 
the, the of course the, the, the total total fear is in room 101 and it's the worst thing in the world and everybody imagines it's the worst thing in the world and that's the secret to that room so it's nice to see that Orwell creates a world that's truly dystopian in a setting and an impact on that setting. Is this the same in Metropolis? I don't think so. The setting of Metropolis is a little bit different. There's, there's greater contrast certainly in the setting of Metropolis and I've talked about that in a previous lecture where I looked at the different techniques that he used. The city of Metropolis has very different worlds that people inhabit. The class divisions are very clear. The rich who inhabit a world of beauty and they're, they're an idle bunch um, signified by, by the fun they have in the nightclub. And the poor live in a very different world. They live down in the depths, in the dark, in a soul-destroying environment. And there's this, the, this deep contrast between those two settings. And then you get some other little minor settings. You get Rotwang's old little house in the middle of this futuristic city. And you get the Gothic church, which seems an anachronism in the modern world but very suited to Lang's time. And as I said, if you go back to the context, you'll work those things out. It, Lang based his ideas on what he believed would be the future at the time, just as Orwell did. Giant skyscrapers dominate the environment. Planes fly between the buildings. Great roads punctuate the cityscape. And it develops from there. It's a much lighter world, the above world. And then we go down into the depths where we see the machine halls don't have any of the luxuries that the wealthy have. It's a dark, grimy existence in noisy caverns, and the places they live are very different to the rich. Even when they come away from work, the buildings are just numbered, there's no names, and it's, it's a very mechanised, um, rough sort of life. And uh, if you look at those two, that's, that's a lovely way to contrast the two texts and, and look at the ideas and link those in with the ideas that I talked about in a previous lecture. Of course, we have the other setting of Rotwang's house, and it's a remnant of sort of a home, a pre-metropolis sort of thing, and it's got a laboratory, and it. It, it opens up, and it, it looks very tiny when it's shot from the outside, but when you go inside, it seems, seems like some sort of magical place that opens up in the middle of the city, and it's disjointed but oddly creative and reflective of Rotwang's um, odd personality. He creates his robotic Maria here. Um, he has his rooms with, without door handles. He can, can't escape and there's a laboratory inside the room. And it, it's very confusing and conflicting but a wonderful setting. And, and certainly Lang creates here a vision, a setting, a house that's reminiscent of the mind of its owner. The cathedral is another setting. Certainly we're all familiar with that sense of cathedral. Um, and here's the conflict, the tension, when the chase comes to its penultimate you know, moments just before the plunging and all, this, all that certainly dramatic spires and gargoyles. And, and these fit in really well with those action scenes where, where they're risking everything really at the end and um, hope is saved. The cathedral offers many opportunities to, for Lang to develop his ideas in setting that enhance the melodramatic aspects. And he needs this to maintain the audience interest because it is a very long film and he needs to change setting quite frequently and create interest around this, not just to follow the narrative, but to, for that visual impact. The nightclub scenes are also integral to conveying the excess and debauched lifestyle of the elites in the city. And we see the nightclub itself being completely ostentatious, brightly lit and reeking of affluence. Um, it, it's in an environment like this that, that the, ro the robot Maria can, can use her charms effectively and create an aura around her that drives them in wild and, and makes their sort of turmoil and their sort of riotous scenes very, very effective. Another scene, another piece of setting you could look at is Joseph Hatt's apartment um, where, where they all meet up. Um, very interesting decor. You've got Friedison's office. You've got lots of different, different um, dramatic settings. And I think you need that in a silent film. And I think Lang certainly does create that. And spent, as we talked about in the, in the previous lecture, a lot of time creating set and making it work for him. 
Lang's dramatic and visually inspired settings for Metropolis certainly give the audience a visual feast, and that's what the film is really about. Um, we see the mirror and reflect character, we see the mirror and reflect the ideas in the film, and each setting has a very specific function which reflects a particular aspect of the film and adds to a character's identity. And we, we talked about in that previous lecture some of the techniques that Lang uses and you should go back and have a look at that lecture to make sure that you understand the setting fully. So think about those settings. Think also finally about the Tower of Babel, the story behind the Tower of Babel, what happens there. It's of course a Bible story and the Tower of Babel is recorded in Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9 and that how that fits in with the ethos and the aura and you need to know that that story so go back have a look at that look at have a look at how and read it try and read that in the king james version of the bible which is far more um flowery and decorative in its language and mirrors that the scene that he's trying to create especially here so basically that's setting and, and think about how each setting and each scene and when you talk about a character look at the setting that they're in and try and make that reflect and you can use the context and contrast the two settings between the two texts and there are lots of similarities and differences. That gives you a brief overview of that. Don't forget if you need more detail go to the student notes on our website or go to the teacher notes on our website if you're a teacher. You can download those um, and make use of those and that will give you a lot more detail about that. I hope you enjoyed that overview of setting. Um, don't forget we have plenty of other lectures coming up. Thank you for watching this one. Goodbye for now.